Thank you very much, Chuck. And I, I have been here four years. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, and very happy here. I love these guys here at National Jewish. Uh, we were kind of, oh, sorry. So we were a little bit like, little bit of, okay. Thank you, Chuck. He's my, uh, my wife. Uh, <laughs> at any rate, uh, it, it's really a pleasure being here. And I just do love, Chuck's my boss. So don't say bad things about me to Chuck. There are other people you can talk about. And just by the way, in terms of the uh, uh, interpreting microbiology stuff, we do have a, a handout for that. It's, a, it's several pages. It's not comprehensive or all inclusive, but it, it'll give, it does give, I think, a, a decent idea about what to look for. And what I'm gonna do is after my session, we have them up in the clinic and on the day unit. I'm gonna go grab some, and then anybody who wants one is welcome to it. I even forget to give them out in the, in the clinic. So it's nice that we have an opportunity to do that. All right, everybody's favorite topic drug toxicity and side effects. Uh, these are my disclosures. So this is from my friend Richard Wallace. Uh, the gene coding for antibiotic effectiveness in NTN disease is linked to the gene causing nausea. Uh, and this is a perfect talk for before lunch. <laughs> so anybody trying to lose weight, stay awake. Uh, I'll, I'll take your appetite from you. All right. All right, real quickly, the treatment is worse than the disease. I hear this all the time. How many of you guys have been told that? Okay, 50-50, eh, more or less. Um, do you believe it? How many of you believe it? No, it's okay, this is, we're not grading. <laughs> uh, it's funny because last year when I gave this talk, almost everybody in the audience raised their hand for that, uh, whether they, they believed it. So maybe, maybe we're getting better, I don't know. So this is our, this is our conundrum. Um, if we underdiagnose and undertreat, uh, we risk disease progression. But if we're too aggressive in our treatment and inappropriately give antibiotics, we make people sick. So it's a tough balance. And it, it, well, first, let me, let me just give the context to this talk. When I see somebody uh, here uh, or even in Texas, if you come to me, unless you tell me differently, my, my goal for you is eradication of the mycobacterium, is culture negativity. So I'm gonna do everything I can, and that includes all of what I'm about to show you, to do that. And all of that risks toxicity and side effects. If you tell me, and that's not what I want, that, then, then we modify things. But I'm gonna be as aggressive as I can and that, as aggressive as you will tolerate to try to eradicate the organism. So I just, again, that, that's kind of the broad context of this talk. And uh, if you would just sort of keep that in mind. Uh, so uh, the other context that I think is very important for you guys to remember and um, I know you hear this a lot. We are partners. Uh, and, and you know, you, I, you guys know this, I hope you're driving the bus. When I make a recommendation to you or Dr. Daly does, you know, it's not like uh, uh, you have to do what we're telling you. We have to do it together because otherwise it, it just does not work well. Uh, so anyway, um, keep in mind, all of these drugs are not created equal. As a matter of fact, uh, almost none of them are. As you've just heard, uh, for MAC and for abscessus, macrolide, clarithromycin and azithromycin uh, are, are the key to effective therapy. So as we talk about side effects of those drugs, remember that if we lose macrolide with either MAC or a macrolide susceptible abscessus, we've got a big problem, uh, either through resistance or through intolerance. So it's not like a UTI 
where your E. coli can be treated by half a dozen different drugs from different classifications. With MAC, uh, those of you that are baseball fans will understand, we don't have a deep bench. We, we don't have a lot of other drugs to go to. That's an important baseline. Um, so there's my baseball analogy. And as you just heard, in vitro susceptibility report, uh, reports are misleading frequently, or are not helpful. So that's, that's a huge topic for you to discuss with your doctor. And I, I, and I hear it all, all the time. Once again, this little laboratory handout that I've got may be helpful, but people always ask me, well, why don't you use, and I'm gonna use moxifloxacin as the example, um, why don't you use moxifloxacin? The MIC for that is two. It's because it doesn't work, even with an MIC of two. So uh, again, not all drugs are equal. In vitro susceptibility results can be misleading. And these, again, this is stuff you should talk about with your doctor. Um, and of course, this one. You have to carefully consider what are the consequences of stopping one of your drugs, particularly the mac uh, macrolide, fluorithromycin or azithromycin or amicacin. Because replacing them is not easy and you actually sometimes kind of jump in a little deeper hole in terms of side effects and toxicity when you try to replace those drugs. Okay, so am I done? <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Okay, sorry. All right. Uh, so uh, this is a, a kind of a rough list of the available agents. Uh, the blue is MAC. Uh, this pink or salmon is abscessus and in the middle are drugs that we sometimes use for both. So we're gonna start with slowly growing mycobacteria and in, in particular, MAC, and you guys I'm sure rec recognize most of what's up there. All right, any drug can cause a rash. So uh, we stop all of the antibiotics and then generally rechallenge with one drug at a time, starting with the most important drug, which is usually the macrolide to see which one of the drugs is causing you to have the rash. Now, the good news is um, there are protocols to desensitize people to the, the offending antibiotics, uh, some of them, uh, rifampin, ethambutol, uh, even the macrolides. Uh, so a rash is not the end of the world. Usually you can get by uh, either by uh, these desensitization protocols or for instance, clarithromycin and azithromycin do not have complete overlap in terms of their allergy or hypersensitivity inducing properties. In other words, if you have a rash with AZ, you may not have it with clary. So frequently that's what we do. We stop the, the uh, macrolide causing the rash and then rechallenge with the other one. But if necessary, uh, we will try a desensitization protocol. Now, more severe allergic reactions don't lend themselves well to those protocols. So unfortunately, mostly it's just rash that you can overcome uh, with that strategy. So in terms of toxicity, and I, I am gonna spend a few minutes about this because it's so important. Um, liver toxicity is actually pretty rare with the macrolides. Not, it is reported uh, it is worth monitoring liver enzymes, but it just doesn't occur very often. In, in the three drug regimen, rifampin is usually the one that is the culprit. Now, uh, hearing loss and tinnitus, uh, as many of you know, is a problem. Now, as far as hearing loss goes, the hearing loss with macrolide is not permanent. So usually, mostly, when you stop it, the hearing improves. Tinnitus is a tougher problem. Uh, it can be permanent. Again, usually it improves when you stop the macrolide, but it doesn't always go away uh, completely. Now, we, or I won't say we, I, <laughs> there's no one in my pocket. I think that Clary 
is less toxic to the ears than AZ. Uh, Dr. Daly pointed out yesterday that the, the uh, data supporting that statement is pretty poor. But at any rate, when someone has azithromycin-related tinnitus that is intolerable, I stop the azithromycin and I try them on clarithromycin. And I have been successful several times in keeping people on a macrolide by doing that. Their, their tinnitus does not progress when I make the change. But ototoxicity, hearing loss, tinnitus is reported with clarithromycin just like it is with azithromycin. This gets back to what we were talking about before. You know, this is risk and benefit. Is the, the risk of the ear toxicity so bad that you would then uh, abandon the benefit of the macrolide for treating your mycobacteria? And uh, unfortunately or fortunately, that's a personal decision. So, but I, as long as you know that there are consequences, negative ones, by abandoning the macrolide for treating a lot of these bugs, you know, you, you, you got to make a choice. It's damned if you do and damned if you don't. Uh, okay, uh, azithromycin is frequently associated with uh, diarrhea. Uh, uh, let me ask, does anybody know what dysgeusia means? I think it's a great word. Yes. Yes, yeah, uh, I prefer to call it taste perversion. I think that just sounds a little edgier, but uh, anyway, in, those of you that take clary, have taken it will know, you get a funky taste uh, when you take, take it. Uh, the other thing is that uh, the, the clarithromycin particularly can affect the uh, hepatic enzymes that um, uh, uh, metabolize other drugs. So with rifampin, uh, the effect on hepatic enzymes is to rev them up. So they chew up other medicines like birth control pills, steroids, thyroid medication. I'll, I'll show you a list here in just a minute. But clarithromycin does the opposite. Uh, it kind of suppresses the hepatic enzymes. So some, some of the drugs that you will become more toxic because you're taking the clarithromycin in the classic example is rifabutin. In the AIDS epidemic, when we gave a lot of clary with rifabutin, people had terrible rifabutin side effects, like awful uveitis, because of this effect of clarithromycin on liver enzymes, which were supposed to metabolize the rifabutin. All right. And as I mentioned, oh, also, there's not complete overlap, not just with hypersensitivity, but with side effects. So for instance, if you have intolerable diarrhea with azithromycin, clarithromycin doesn't do that. So that's not a, that's not a hard substitution. Um, so we really don't know what the optimal frequency is for uh, monitoring. Uh, we, always, we try to do it at the beginning of therapy and then of course with the onset of any symptoms. Uh, Pre-existing hearing problem would uh, uh, dictate more frequent uh, audiograms. Um, and then we'll get to aminoglycosides in just a second, uh, talking about hearing loss. Um, a word about uh, inhaled amikacin. I'm gonna switch gears here just a bit. Um, and many, I, I'm, I'm amazed at how much people know about inhaled amikacin when I talk to them. Some good, some bad, but uh, it, whatever they're doing, they're, you guys are reading their, uh, their literature. So um, the inhaled amikacin, which is uh, most effective is the liposomal uh, preparation. Um, uh, so it's amikacin liposome. Um, I forgot what the I was for. Amikacin liposome inhalation suspension. Okay, Alice. So that's what I'm gonna call it is, is Alice. Uh, the most common side effect uh, is uh, uh, hoarseness, dysphonia. And then anybody here who's had the drug knows that. 50% of people who use this medicine get hoarse. Now, what's interesting about it is that if you stop the drug, 
and the hoarseness improves and you rechallenge with the drug, the hoarseness generally doesn't come back or isn't as severe. And I will just tell you right away, I have no clue how that happens. Actually, I don't think anybody knows why that happens. But if it didn't happen, uh, this drug would not have been FDA approved. If everybody stayed hoarse the whole time they were on the drug, that would have been intolerable for everybody. But I just wanted to mention it, if your doc wants to put you on Alice, uh, if, if the doc doesn't mention the hoarseness, please ask. Now, the other side effects generally are also respiratory, cough, shortness of breath, wheezing, uh, that can be approached also uh, with uh, uh, appropriate interventions. Um, we don't use a lot of the IV amicacin uh, by inhalation, partly because it's not been studied. The ALICE has been in two large randomized trials and it is effective. So this is another one where you've got this risk benefit problem or choice. The drug works, but it also has sometimes intolerable side effects. All right. Now there is one other side effect. Um, I'm just gonna mention briefly, it's called hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Um, so um, rarely uh, people who take or inhale the ALICE, get a, an immunologically mediated pneumonia, which is basically what this is. And on, that's this little area on this x-ray uh, and here and here. So uh, when you read ground glass opacity on your x-ray report, that's what, that's what these guys are. And uh, the most common reason we see those is because of ALICE. You stop the ALICE and the ground glass opacities go away. So uh, it, this is a twofold problem. One is when somebody comes in and they're short of breath on ALICE, when do you pull the trigger on a new CAT scan? Uh, you know, uh, or do you try different things before you do the CAT scan? And the second is, they have a, you got a little bit of hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Is it okay to continue the ALICE? Uh, and, and those are still problems in evolution. But uh, the one thing I do wanna point out to you, when you're reading your x-ray reports and it says ground glass opacities, that is mostly not, or almost never related to mycobacterial disease. It's something else. For instance, uh, bleeding, aspiration, viral illness, drugs. But you know, it, it is kind of alarming when you look at an x-ray report and you've not seen those words before, you think, oh my gosh, what the hell is this? Well, it's just not MAC. That's what I can tell you. Um, amicacin. Uh, uh, and, and you know, this is again the second most important drug we've got. So uh, when you have uh, bad disease, uh, we, we reach for the IV amicacin. Um, now, unfortunately, the ear toxicity with amicacin intravenously is uh, uh, usually permanent. So it, this has to be monitored very carefully. We do it with amicacin levels, both uh, trough levels and peak levels. So if you're on uh, IV amicacin and your doctor's not requesting those, you should ask him or her, why not? That, that's how you try to minimize the toxicity of the IV amicacin. Now, the inhaled amicacin, uh, and particularly the ALICE, is not absorbed well into the blood. So the systemic exposure to amicacin is about 10 times less than the systemic exposure with IV amicacin. Now, having said that, you still can have ear problems with ALICE. Um, unfortunately, it, it doesn't go away completely, but kidney problems are very, very rare with ALICE. They're even unusual with IV amicacin if you're monitoring, but with ALICE, it's almost a non-issue. Um, 
A thing to tall in the eyes. That's always something that everybody is interested in, uh, not surprisingly. Um, decreased visual acuity, blurry vision, uh, blind spots, and red-green color blindness are the characteristic manifestations of ophthalmutal ocular toxicity. So if you're at a traffic light and it looks like green is on top and red is on the bottom, that's a problem. <laughs> if you're on a thambutal, you need to tell somebody. Um, it may take weeks or months. Um, it is usually reversible. Uh, I wish I could tell you it's always reversible. That's not the case. It is very rarely irreversible, but it does, that does occur. And I, you know, after years and years of talking to people, when I talk about a thambutal, um, I'm reminded of a Larson cartoon. Do you guys know Larson, the far side? He's got a great cartoon where this guy's talking to his dog and it shows in a balloon what the dog hears. So he's hearing blah, 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 Rex, blah, 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 Rex, <laughs> et cetera. So when I talk about a thambutal, I go through all of this, I get to the part where blindness can occur, bingo, they wake up. And, and ask me about that. But please keep in mind, the thambutal is a critical element in the, in the regimen for MAC. And without it, it, replacing it is not easy. So it happens, but it's very rare. Um, and partly it's very rare because we're pretty conservative about dosing. And three times weekly dosing is, uh, appears to be safer on the eyes than daily dosing for a thambutal. So uh, we recommend uh, visual acuity and color vision testing, uh, just a wall chart and um, the uh, little book with the snakes the, with, with a different color. This, the, the Ishihara tests are online. Uh, you can self-administer those anytime you want. And uh, what uh, our group generally recommends is you pick uh, a newspaper or a magazine with a particular font and at a, at a specific distance, you look at it every day just to see if you have any, any change in your visual acuity in trying to read the same letters at the same distance every day. Um, and unfortunately, there's not one simple diagnostic test for it. I will tell you, uh, my colleague Richard Wallace and I did a kind of a small study back in the, in the aughts, I think, uh, looking at three times weekly and daily ethambutal and optic neuritis. In our patients who had visual symptoms, nine out of 10 of them, when they went to an ophthalmologist, had another explanation for the symptoms. Cataracts, uh, uh, you know, uh, needed glasses or glaucoma, all of that stuff. So it is still, for, it's less than 1% of people who take the ethambutol. But again, um, as you probably heard, your eye symptoms aren't gonna come on on the day that you see the doctor. It's gonna be between appointments. So it is incumbent upon you guys to report that. And then I tell everybody, you get new eye symptoms, stop the drug. And then, then we'll figure out what to do. Fortunately, most of the time, it's not going to be the ethambutol. Now, just one last little caveat. Um, all of these good, young ophthalmologists out there, you know, that take great care of your eyes, none of them have ever seen TB. So they've never seen ethambutol. So you go in there, you tell them what medicines you're on, and, he, you know, maybe there's some visual acuity change. They love to assign your problem to a thambutal. They have no clue how important it is to us. So you may have to educate your uh, ophthalmologist about, uh, look, buddy, I, I don't want to quit the thambutal if I don't have to. Are you sure? If you don't do that, I will. Um, hair loss. Has anybody, well, I won't ask. But this was one I couldn't figure out for a long time. And it turns out it's at the ambulance. Um, rifampin and rifabutin, 
Uh, this is the one that's likely to cause hepatotoxicity. Um, there are some uh, funny, rare problems associated with rifampin, like low platelet count and uh, kidney failure. And that's why you have to continue your uh, visits with whoever is taking care of your MAC. Um, and you have to have periodic blood done because those are extremely rare, but you can't pick them up without doing the blood work. Um, and rifampin is much more potent inducer of the uh, hepatic enzymes than is rifabutin. Rifabutin also causes skin hyperpigmentation. Uh, you guys all know about the hyperpigmentation with clofazamine. So if you're taking these two drugs, <laughs> <laughs> you want to stand up? No, <laughs> uh, um, you're likely to get a pretty good tan. So this is just a brief, uh, uh, non, not inclusive at all, uh, look at drugs that are affected by rifampin and rifabutin. Your doctor, your care, the people who care for you have to know what you're taking and how much you're taking when you're on rifampin and rifabutin or macrolide, for that matter, clarithromycin. Ah, um, uh, this was from Gwen Hewitt. I know a lot of you guys know Gwen. This, this is what she said. And Gwen was a big clofazamine advocate. It's not as bad as it sounds. Just for your reassurance, the dose that we use of clofazamine is the lowest dose that you can give for anything like leprosy or TB and it, have it be effective. Any lower dose, it, it just doesn't do very much. So just to reassure you, at 100 milligrams a day, you're, you're getting as little as you possibly can that, that might work. Uh, okay, now the rest of this is I, I, again, I'm going back to the philosophy part of the talk. So uh, these are drugs, oh, well, uh, just real quick, uh, some drugs for uh, uh, abscesses. Uh, we like imipenem better than cefoxetin. Um, this is a drug that we use when we have what's called dual beta-lactam therapy. Uh, Tigecycline and omatocycline, those of you with abscesses are familiar with these. Um, Tigecycline can make a doorknob throw up. <laughs> and I know any of you that have taken it will, will swear to that. Omatocycline, it appears to be less toxic and also appears to be effective. So it's our go-to oral drug now for abscesses. Now, the biggest problem with metacycline is its cost. Has anybody encountered that? Has anybody tried to get metacycline without insurance? It's about $13,000 a month. So I guess if we, if we held up everybody here in the audience, we might be able to get a month's worth of uh, metacycline. And uh, Linazolid is worth talking about because it also causes optic neuritis and uh, it can cause problems with the uh, bone marrow. But the last thing I'm gonna close with, uh, and this is a monitoring schedule. Did you guys have a copy of the slides? Oh, okay, I'll have to be sure you get uh, a copy of these so you can go through the monitoring uh, stuff. It, it is important. But the last thing I want to talk about, and I'm gonna do it in just two minutes, if I can get there. Um, and it, it, again, let me get you a copy so you can read these. These are some of the strategies for trying to, but the last thing here on the list is discontinuing the drug. Uh, you should try everything you can safely to maintain particularly macrolide uh, and uh, that, but I, I will close by saying there is no substitute for macrolide treating MAC, not one single drug. You have to do fairly aggressive things like use intravenous amikacin 
or bedaquiline or some of these other drugs. It's that important. Um, and unfortunately for amikacin, that's, that's also the, the problem. There's not one single drug other than macrolide that you could replace amikacin with. So uh, I don't want all of you to suffer. I'm not a sadist. I don't want you to go out there and start throwing up and stuff. Um, and it's important to talk with your doctor about the side effects of your medicines. Absolutely. But please try, try to work with the, that poor individual <laughs> who wants to do the best for you, and understanding that there are steps that, you, that can be taken that are not easily compensated for. Okay, that's plenty. I've beaten you all to death with this stuff. Uh, is it lunchtime? Can I say it's lunchtime? Okay, it's lunchtime. <laughs>